Good morning, everybody. Um, we're going to finish up Cohen today and maybe start talking about multiculturalism. I hope. That's my plan. Um, and uh, before I, I start recording here, um, uh, I was just chatting very briefly here with Mark and um, asked him about how the paper was going. And Mark, you mentioned that you're working, still working on respecting the arguments of the other side. And I, I just want to take this opportunity to re-emphasize how important that is. Um, I, I, this came out up in a phone call I was having last night, too. I was having lots of phone calls again last night. And can do that again tonight if people want to get a hold of me. Um, there's, uh, in terms of how I'm, I'm grading these papers, um, I had that uh, it, instructions and grading sort of document that I sent out there that let you, that I tried to highlight and let you know like what I'm thinking about when I'm making an evaluation of your paper. And this is one of the features that's really, really important. Um, being able to come up with decent arguments for your opponent is necessary for a couple of reasons. Um, things I've mentioned before here, but they're just they're, they're worth reiterating for emphasis. Um, one is that if you don't have good arguments for your opponent, then you may not have a rational controversy on your hands. And you want to be making some kind of ambitious contribution to sorting out something that's not easy to sort out. That isn't just a matter of being aware of the facts or thinking for five seconds about what is going on with one thing or another thing, um, but something where reasonable people who are informed, sincere, invested in doing the right thing, so they're like morally curious, could disagree and or not be sure, be um, uncertain as to what is the most rationally defensible position on some issue or another. Um, so that's that it's really crucial to have um, to be bringing in and weaving into your conversation of your topic uh, what are compelling arguments for the other side because without that then we don't really have a compelling debate that someone needs to write a paper about um, at least in terms of the philosophical work of truth seeking we need papers written on all sorts of subjects just for the sake of advocacy and education right people just need to know about some stuff perhaps um, that's one type of project, but that's that's not the kind of project that we're attempting to do in this class. I mean, those projects are fine. There's nothing wrong with advocacy. <laughs> nothing wrong with informing people about things that they may be ignorant about. Um, but a lot of times those projects are about sort of trivial matters. It's just a matter of people getting on board about. Um, there are other things that are not so trivial that do require some more careful thinking in order to sort out what really does make the most sense. Um, that's why I really like, uh, this is a good kind of intro to the multiculturalism topic and why I've been excited for it all quarter long. Um, because it may seem like um, tolerance for diversity and an embracing of the value of diversity is just a trivially good thing. <laughs> like it's a no-brainer. Um, that's what the liberal philosophers thought. The tradition of liberalism is just like, and of course tolerance, you know. Um, toler tolerance for diversity of opinion and even lifestyle, um, that that's uh, it's just a basic moral imperative. Um, but when we dig into it and think about what should that look like, um, how do we set up this cooperative system of society to support a value on tolerance, there are some tricky wrinkles that, that show up. Um, and that Sarah Song article does, a, I think, a fantastic job of summarizing um, a lot of what is perplexing about how to execute on that. As I've been working with some of you on your papers, um, sometimes a topic doesn't have a, a straightforward rational controversy to it, but sometimes we can find a controversy nearby. So say, if, if it was a debate between tolerance and intolerance, I mean, that, that might not be the best paper topic, just because what are you going to do in terms of justifying intolerance, right? Um, but what what does it mean to value tolerance? You've got two people who agree tolerance is a good value, um, that diversity is valuable. How? What are other things that they could disagree about given that shared commonality of, of uh, premise or axiom to start with, right? Um, so uh, that's, what you, that's one of the things that is why the opponent is so important for your paper. The other main reason is because if you only give your side of things, you only put down the concerns and considerations that speak in favor of your thesis, then your treatment of the 
of the issue is sort of half formed and your ability to defend your side is that much more impoverished it's it's that much weaker if you haven't faced off against what your opponent can throw at you or what causes for concern or objection they might have to what you're what you're offering what you're throwing down um, because that's going to happen I mean if you've got a rational controversy on your hands if you've got a good topic picked out then your thesis will of necessity have resistance <laughs> you know there will be good reasons for thinking that you're not correct and if you don't engage or with that then that uh, threat is still out there on the table and someone may still you know read your paper and be like yeah uh -huh, I know about this side of it but what about this other thing that's why I'm not buying this and you're in your paper you get to anticipate that you know by pr bringing up ahead of time being honest about it rather than hiding or I hope they don't bring this up kind of thing you know <laughs> you're just you're you're looking under the bed for the boogeyman and confronting it straight up so that's a big part of giving an adequate defense of your position. It's kind of part of burden of proof. Um, arguments or defenses of positions that anticipate the strongest possible objections the opponent can throw and then are able to adequately deal with it are way stronger than arguments that never bring up the opponent in the first place. So that's the other, the other big reason for this. And I, I did want to, um, this has come up in a few conversations with people, but Engaging with your opponent is not just a matter of acknowledging their existence or even putting down a couple ideas of what they have to say. Uh, and there's some ways in which engaging with your opponent could be like they're this, well, I mean, the idea of a straw man is you're fighting something that can't fight back, right? That's the kind of metaphor. This isn't quite straw manning, but if you set up the opponent and then you're just like, you're wrong on this, that, and the other thing, it's just kind of a punching bag for you to like bounce off of here. The most robust integration of your opponent in your paper is to let them do some counter punching. So when you make an argument in the in the paper, imagine how the opponent can respond. Don't just have them set up as a target for you to go to town on. That's not really engaging with your opponent. That's just attacking your opponent, right? Let them let them fight back a little bit. If you're making a proposal in your paper, if that's your thesis, and you're giving a defense of it. Think about how someone who's reading your paper may not buy what you're selling. Right? What could, when you make the appeal of, well, this is right because of this, or this is what we should believe because of this, think about how someone can respond back. Okay, and then that that even if you uh, like a couple people who are I've been talking to, are doing a paper where they're kind of criticizing some other view, and that's their thesis that this position is wrong. So of course you got to set that up. Um, you got to set up the opponent. And maybe give a little bit of a, the backstory on <clears throat> why that opponent position looks good or makes sense, and then you <clears throat> criticize it, right? That's just your primary project. That's not engaging with the opponent in the way that I'm looking for. Do that counter punching, letting them kind of talk back at you, that's the kind of thing that you really want to integrate into your paper. And that's what I'll be looking for. Um, okay, so. <clears throat> Any other questions you've got? Uh, I th it's not, maybe not a bad idea to t take a little bit of time here to talk about the paper, since it's due so soon. Any other questions people want to throw in there? If you've got a question, chances are someone else in the class has a question, so it's, it's good to, to answer the question for everybody. Nothing? What are some questions your other classes had for the paper? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean, Mark. My my other classes, like other classes that I teach where I have a paper project, where someone has to write a philosophy paper. Oh, boy. Um, I, uh, I'm not sure I can answer your question at the moment. Um, I mean, there's tons of questions that people can have about writing philosophy papers. Um, so just reporting on all of them, I... I don't know if I could do that project for you. Uh, I might need something a little bit more targeted. 
Um, there's, there's a lot of things that people can have questions about. The concern that you hear the most. Um, I don't know. Hmm. There isn't one that jumps out. I mean, most people have a lot of trouble engaging with the opponent. It's just hard to do. Um, and it's not so much like there's a question about it, but um, kind of like that it's just challenging. Uh, it's hard for us to have intellectual empathy for positions that we think are wrong, that we think are misguided. Um, maybe you've heard of confirmation bias before. And confirmation bias um, is a kind of cognitive bias where uh, the things that pop out to you in your attention, in like looking at things, making observations of things, or even just like imaginative speculation, the things that pop up and come to mind tend to be those things that reinforce or are consistent with the beliefs that you are operating with, the lens through which you look at the world. Um, and that means you miss what are things that are good arguments that your opponents might have, and you miss ways in which your position may have weaknesses. That, that cognitive bias affects your ability to do those two things. So you're kind of having to swim upstream a little bit um, against the current of your own psychology to do this sort of thing. And some of the ancient pre-Socratic philosophers in, in, in the, the Western tradition of philosophy make such a big deal out of this that, they're, that doing philosophy is almost like a spiritual path where you have to rewrite your own character to make yourself the kind of person who can't be a truth seeker. Like this is very, very salient to them as uh, something that you're, you're up against um, to succeed on that project. Um, but the questions about, um, or the, the more specific questions about how to find an opponent or how to deal with them usually have to do with the contingent differences of what particular topic they're working on, so advice might look a little different. But I might remind you about the general advice that I gave when I drew that chart on the on the uh, board. Remember, of like you and your opponent, and the advantages that you have, and the disadvantages that the opponent position has, but also like the disadvantages you have and the the positive position that your opponent can have, and then how you could like talk about those things, like dispute them, right? That each one of those sectors formally is like a place where there might be opportunity for objection. So sometimes it can just get your imaginative juices flowing to imagine what what could the discussion look like in my particular topic in each of those kind of four quadrants. Definitely you do not need to address all four quadrants to kind of that that's not necessarily the recommendation here. Um, but if you're really hunting for stuff, recognize that it could take each of those four different forms. It could be that your opponent is challenging the things that are advantages to your position. It could be that they're trying to saddle you with baggage, that you've got problems here and then you needed to defend against or respond to the, the significance of those weaknesses of your position. The opponent could try to establish that their position has very good reasons and then you need to deal with those arguments. Or they could try to defend against the problems that they, the, the weaknesses that you maybe have identified about their position. Um, Niha says, do I need to dedicate an entire paragraph from my opposing side or just a couple of sentences? Um, ideally here, multiple paragraphs. I mean, this it shouldn't be a throwaway thing. Um, this is a main, it's like you're kind of equal parties in this conversation. Uh, now, it makes sense that there's going to be a little bit more space taken up for the defense of your side, especially if you're offering something new or novel. Then you're going to have to explain that. Um, but definitely throw away things from your opponent like, like one, this, is, this is a good thing for me to be talking about. In terms of engaging with your opponent, don't let them just send you a tweet or just a little sound bite like, blah, 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 blah. Like, like maybe you've heard people, if you're imagining kind of a straw man opponent, someone who just has like this little thing that they're like, but what about that? Like, what if that doesn't make sense because of this. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> Try to give them some time. Um, flesh them out. Um, are, describe their position as if you were a believer, as if you were a true believer in their position. You know, you want to paint it in the most charitable light. You want to allow them to have the space necessary to be intelligible and maybe to be a little subtle. 
that um, really ham-fisted objections, those are generally going to be straw man arguments. Um, but recognizing your opponent is capable of all the cleverness and subtlety that you are capable of in defending your position, and what might they do to present their concerns in the most reasonable way, <clears throat> rather than overblowing them. Extreme positions are not always um, objectionable, like I love MLK's little aside about extremity in, in Letter from a Birmingham Jail, but it is something to keep in mind, is just don't forget, there are other, you know, on the spectrum of some continuum of belief or perspective, you've got the, the sort of extreme positions and they draw a lot of attention, sort of defining the two ends of a pole or a dispute, but there's also a lot of nuanced positions that might be in between that too. And which one is the most rationally defensible? Lots of options there. Is that making sense, Nia? Mm -hmm. Okay. Dang it. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm really happy we're talking about the paper here. Um, I think I'm sharing things that are important to hear sort of toward the tail end of the time you've got while you're working on this. Um, just good reminders about things. But I'm like, oh, we're gonna get. I want to get to multiculturalism, um, so I might move it along. But I don't want to rush it because I've only had a couple people actually contribute. No, no, no. You shouldn't apologize, Nia. I, you did exactly what I invited. And I actually, I'm like, even though I'm antsy, um, I want to create just a little bit more space for more people to share because I only had two people in the chat this morning so far. So anything else that I mean, the paper project is a pretty big part of your life with this class right now so um, I, I want to I want to address questions if you've got them or concerns if you've got them and I think it is really valuable to share them I've been having like like three four hours of phone calls a day this week and um, you know I say a lot of things multiple times but if there are some things that I can like answer for everybody then that's great that's great and so far the stuff we've been talking about has been in that category anyone else who's in chat do you have questions or concerns about the paper um, that I could maybe help address right now? Not super related to the content of the paper, but how would you like us to cite sources? I don't care. Whatever way you want to do it. MLA, Chicago style, doesn't matter. As long as you're identifying those sources and making it clear what ideas you are attributing to them, that you got from them, that's going to be fine with me. This isn't, this isn't an English class. Um, <clears throat> I always say to my students, like, all the English stuff you got English classes, writing classes for that. Uh, for philosophy class, it's all about ideas, thinking, arguments. That's the main thing. Need to be in a different page, right? Um, yeah, I mean, footnotes happen all the time. Um, having a bibliography at the end of the paper is not a bad idea. But like I said, I, I'm, I'm really not a stickler here about format for that. That's not a priority for me. I will not be grading on it. If you don't, if you're using sources and not citing them at all, that would be a small issue in my book but so definitely do that that's that's good practice um, but it's not the focus of I, I'm I'm interested in the intellectual work that you're doing in this paper How many sources do we need or can we just focus on our own ideas so <clears throat> I said this isn't a research paper and you don't have to do any research other than this mm. you know thinking for yourself is a kind of research you know you're exploring the realm of possible arguments possible solutions um, so that that can be fine for this assignment I didn't want to make it into a formal research paper that said doing research is a great way to bring in important ideas to your 
conversation. Um, but I, I wanted to do it as um, uh, in this manner where you have to decide about it so that sources are not this perfunctory hoop jumping activity. Um, but if you use them, <clears throat> you're using them because of a sincere good reason that you've got a justification for doing so. Um, that you're like, I got this idea. It's influencing how I'm thinking, whether it's and, and my understanding of this debate and discussion, whether it's an argument for your side or an argument from your opponents, listening to what others say is great for doing the best work you can do, right? To just ignore and block everyone else out and be like, it's only going to be my ideas that I'm going to consider is really just hamstringing yourself uh, from maybe being able to do better work. So I think of True Seeking as a cooperative project that we do together. It requires personal investment and recognizing it's not all you right and listening to others can be a great way to do that so um, I wanted to take any use of research or sources out of this artificial framework of I need to get so many sources for my paper and instead just be like pick a topic like have some ambition to solve some problem and if you're like hmm I could probably use some help listening to other people about this problem um, to help me understand the controversy or what the options are or how I might defend something or what I need to be worried about in defending my position. That's a much more natural and sincere and authentic motivation for bringing in sources. So, so there's none that are required and there's not a number that is required. But if you're using, if you're getting ideas for your paper from other places, you absolutely need to acknowledge that not acknowledging the contributions of others that have influenced what you're able to do is plagiarism. Plagiarism is not just copy and pasting papers, but it's not acknowledging people for their contributions, kind of thanking them, saying, hey, this person de deserves credit for putting together this idea. I'm really thankful to it. I think it's a good idea. It's not so much like intellectual property rights or some crap like that. It's really just... Um, sort of an acknowledgement of, I didn't come up with this, this other person did, thank you for that, that kind of thing. Um, do you have to use direct quotes for evidence? Well, n uh, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that, Naomi. Um, direct quotes are not a bad thing to do. Um, the only way direct quotes really, I think, start to become a problem is if you're just copy and pasting big chunks of text into your paper and not doing anything to describe or explain those ideas or what you want to do with them. Um, but remember uh, something I mentioned from my lectures way back weeks ago when we talked about this assignment for the first time. Um, evidence uh, doesn't, like philosophical debate and argumentation, <clears throat> doesn't use evidence in the same way that other types of research papers do. I mean, citing some professional philosopher or famous philosopher from history that believes what you believe is no proof that you're right. It just isn't. We don't take anything on authority here. Um, <clears throat> it's all about the ideas themselves and whether those ideas justify their conclusions. Um, Mark says, are you going to respond to the paper even though you aren't grading the effectiveness of our, of our arguments? Um, if, if by that you mean you want feedback, you're absolutely invited to request feedback from me and I will do everything in my power to do that. Um, <clears throat> this, the way that this uh, assignment is going, uh, this will not happen before the end of the quarter, but I will be making a very explicit and <laughs> I want to encourage you to ask for it and then I'm going to do it. Um, so if you want to know about what I thought about your paper, if you care about my opinion, then I'm happy to give it to you. Cool. All right, let's finish up. Uh, thank you for all these questions. Um, I hope this has been helpful. Uh, let's, uh, let's finish up Cohen here. So <clears throat> right where we left it off yesterday, I was talking about um, the, what's sort of the fourth section of Cohen's paper uh, where he's talking about how do we compare, now that we've got the whole setup here, and we're like, okay, freedom matters. We're, we're sort of premising this as a, a moral value that ought to inform um, how we set up society and freedom again is going to be understood as your ability to do things so your your actual opportunities for doing things um, what you what you are able to do is the phrase here right and <clears throat> I was talking at the end of class right at the end yesterday about how I appreciate this next section where Cohen acknowledges that 
figuring out whether one system or another system provides more freedom is not an easy thing to evaluate that it always requires um, a sensitivity to context he, he I mean he well he talks about two ways of of evaluating how much freedom do I get out of this model for society like a, a political theory um, the the formal and abstract one and then the one that is sort of concrete or that's taking a, a particular context into account so the formal concrete one might be like uh, in a vacuum I'm just imagining this like theoretical system in which here are the rules what is theoretically allowable and not allowable that's one thing right but once you take that system of what those conventions are for what people what's permissible for people to do and then put it into practical circumstances then it changes a little bit um, like when we were talking yesterday about how um, under capitalism there's no like restrictions um, or very few restrictions on what sorts of buying and selling activities are possible so like in a vacuum there's a lot of, of economic opportunity here but in practice in the concrete uh, sort of embodiment of that system for some people there there really isn't all of this freedom it's not a wide open space for them to engage with that they can't pay the toll to gain access to those things um, so um, there, there was a uh, I was actually talking with a student last night who took a class from me before and wrote their paper on a very very interesting book um, about uh, basically critically thinking about what we buy and sell in our society and maybe what things should be bought and sold and which things shouldn't like what kinds of aspects to our society shouldn't be up for the market to to set um, like uh, one of one of his fa this is from a philosopher named Michael Sandel one of his favorite examples was um, waiting in line at the airport so now you can pay a little extra money and not have to wait in line <laughs> and he was he was kind of complaining about this or bemoaning this because he's like when it comes to lines the, this like social system of a queue it's first come first serve totally egalitarian or you know there's probably still some contextual things here that make for disparity but if you're really rich or really poor if you show up and you put yourself in line then you are going to be served in the order in which you appeared in that line um, but if now we say well this is another thing this is another aspect of our lives that's available for markets to regulate or basically control or influence um, maybe that is not for the good like we think selling buying and selling human beings is not morally appropriate that's not something that should be a part of the market no matter how much economic freedom it would give um, this is not something that's morally acceptable maybe there's a case to be made for other things like this as well um, so like buying and selling organs for example um, which is what my student was writing about um, so <clears throat> there can be questions about what things do you want to make play by the rules of the free market and that might affect freedom and access as well think about whether all schools were private if all education was part was regulated by markets if there was no public school public schools are a socialist system right state just pays for it, makes it available to everybody or is supposed to in practice again things aren't always so equitable but um, if we didn't have any public schools there'd be much less of that and then education would be very much even more so tied to your economic status than it is already right now um, and that could be a real issue right in terms of what people are able to do what they're able to gain access to but this thing that that Cohen is being very very sensitive to is that when you got the formal abstract and the concrete both lenses are kind of important for our evaluation but it's messy it's really sticky I love his example of the Jeep and the sports car and you're like which of these can go faster and you're like well the sports car it's got a more powerful engine blah 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 but if you imagine that the a race between these two cars is happening on um, like a mountainous dirt road then the sports car isn't gonna go faster than the Jeep the Jeep will be able to go faster on that terrain 
if you're talking about a like highway, then yeah, the sports car is going to win. So it may depend on the circumstances whether capitalism or communism gives more freedom to people in society. Right? It might, it, there might be some sensitivity to that. It'd be really interesting to pin those things down and figure out where those lines are drawn. But that's one thing that um, that uh, Cohen is sensitive to here. That it, it's not it's not something that can be evaluated purely in theory. But we might want to think about all the kind of counterfactual terrain that we might be in. Um, one of the other things I thought was really really fascinating, um, and I, I'm gonna uh, read here a little bit from the notes. I I have to uh, keep track of all the things I want to say. Um, he said um, he acknowledges that one of the circumstances for whether communism would give people more freedom or not, like whether, maybe it wouldn't compared to capitalism, depends on the attitude and beliefs of the people in society. So, and he's very clearly talking about America here, um, kind of tongue in cheek a little bit, but it's like most Americans do not believe that a communist revolution would actually make them more free. They're actually terrified of it, and they think it's going to make them less free, right? Um, well, Cohen is just like, right or wrong, like he's a Marxist, right? He thinks communism is going to bring more freedom to, I think he would say to Americans, that in our context, it would it would be the faster car in that terrain. Um, but he's like, if people don't believe it, if they don't have the buy-in to it, then this is not going to be something that actually does give them more freedom. So it's, it's kind of like um, our beliefs about it could be a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, basically, Cohen says a communist revolution is not um, a very viable sort of thing to happen right now just because it's not popular. And not to say that everything depends on the popularity of something. He's not some kind of cultural relativist or something like that. But he's saying, like, basically, if the entire population doesn't think that this is going to actually give them freedom, even if it does... Um, then you're going to have to violate a lot of people's freedom to make it happen. And he doesn't seem to necessarily be cool just kind of taking that kind of classic Marxist line that revolution is necessary here. Um, there's going to be a lot of cost for that. Um, okay. Yeah, if you, if you want to, like, open up other areas of opportunity, it may mean in a temporary period, really highly restricting people's freedoms, too. And that, that can sometimes be worth the trade-off as well. Um, but that he's, I'm just kind of saying, uh, Cohen doesn't give us all the answers here. And he's written many other books, and you can read what he has to say about the revolution and, and making cultural change. But what you can get a little glimpse of here is that he's sensitive that this is not a straightforward sort of thing. It doesn't have a straightforward solution. So to get to the real meat of the argument of this paper... <clears throat> what Cohen wants to say uh, is that communism and socialist programs, things that are kind of in the direction of communally held property instead of privately held property, um, that that has more opportunity for freedom than under private property systems. And not just that it's more freedom, but it's freedom of the same kind that capitalism is promising. So the, the capitalist system of private property is promising a certain type of freedom, and socialism and communism is giving you more of it, um, of the kind that you wanted here, with a, one very, very notable exception, uh, which I'll get to. I mean, there's some ways in which I think Cohen could have been a little bit more explicit about this, but I think under analysis, you're like, yeah, it's not exactly the same thing, Cohen, and you kind of think that that's a good thing. <laughs> so we'll, we'll get to that little wrinkle here in a second. But um, if you're thinking about freedom... The way we've kind of been unpacking it, if you followed the arguments so far and you're like, yep, Cohen, your setup here makes sense. No straw manning is going on here. You know, we found some common terms to be able to have this discussion between the capitalist and the communist, this kind of thing. Um, there are different conceptions of justice. We're on the same page now about what we mean by freedom, that this is about an ability to do things, about what you have access to, what are actual options for you to choose. That is what freedom consists in. Um, then capitalism gives you lots of freedom when it comes to the things that you own. That, uh, what he calls at certain points, full freedom, right, is what uh, you get total domination of an object. I get, if I wanted to just smash this Mr. Spock mug, I could do it, goddammit. 
It's my mug. I don't want to do it, but I have that power. And not just like I can do it physically, but that it is morally permitted, right? It's socially permitted by the way that our system works. Hey, if I want to destroy my own shit, that's uh, that's on me, right? Um, if this was communally held and I wanted to smash it, well, now I'm taking away property rights of other people. Uh, it isn't just mine to do whatever I want with, right? So that seems like communism is putting more of a limitation on my freedom with respect to this object. And Cohen's like, that's correct. That is correct. But this is not the only way. Uh, we can't just look at it in a vacuum of this object versus this object versus this object. What do I gain if I give up total ownership or full control, full freedom with regard to something? Well, I may have some extra opportunities. Um, basically, Cohen's argument is that um, I can have a bunch of partial freedoms add up to more freedom overall than what I get under a system where my freedoms with regard to things only come under the form of full ownership or total control, total ownership. All right, so um, full freedoms can be outweighed by more partial freedoms and I really like this example of the dude with the tools uh, or, or kind of a thing that's oftentimes remarked is like an absurdity of American consumerism like in the 50s for example let's say you live on a neighborhood block everyone's got their own lawnmower everyone has bought their own lawnmower it's like do you need to have that many lawnmowers lawnmower companies love it <laughs> right if everyone has to buy their own lawnmower but really realistically how many lawnmowers do we need to be able to mow our lawns? Like, people aren't interested in, maybe some people are, but most people are not interested in mowing their lawn every day. Or even every hour of every day, right? Their total control that they have over their lawnmower under private property system means that they could mow the lawn whenever they want, right? They, they, if they want to mow all day long, they could, right? If they don't want to, they don't have to. They have those choices. But in terms of the kind of access I care to have, I'm not interested in actually exercising that control at all times. What I want is my lawn to look nice and decent. Maybe different people have want that in different to different degrees. What if we saved resources by not making a million lawnmowers, but we made less lawnmowers and then shared them? Then people could still gain access to the lawnmower to the extent that they want to have access to it um, and now our resources are freed up for other things um, so the, the is this going to take some organization and are there going to be costs with it you betcha whenever you have to share something you have to kind of work it out I still remember growing up with my brother and sister and we had an old uh, Apple II it was our first computer um, and man we all of us wanted to be on that computer all the time and like mess around with it and learn about it and computing was pretty cool right and there were very very simple games to play on it back then there wasn't a whole lot of um i wasn't super excited to think about some of the games we played on that computer but you know it was a an attractive item to have access to and so we had to share it and we had to create a system for sharing and you know that had its uh bonks but definitely my family couldn't afford to buy a computer for each one of us kids i mean especially back then um, so we had one computer and we shared it um, using resources in a different way wouldn't have made any kind of sense um, that's kind of how the communist is looking at things when it comes to shared property um, what stuff can we if if we share more things we might have some more things to share it's kind of like toddler um, toddler society 101 right if the only things you're allowed to play with are the things that you own well you don't get access to a lot of toys but if we're under a system of sharing where you have partial access partial ownership of a bunch of things maybe that actually gives you more of the freedom that you care to have in your life you get to do you get to have opportunities for more things um, uh, let's let's go with the two the tools example so two neighbors that both like to work on cars and bikes and carpentry and all sorts of stuff craft projects that you want tools for 
Well, there's so many different tools that are useful, and they're useful for different jobs. And if each person has to buy all of the tools that they are going to be able to use, then they're going to have to really prioritize some things over other things, and they're going to have to get the basics, and maybe some of the more advanced or specialized stuff they're not going to be able to have. But if they get together and they're like, hey, we both have the same hobby, let's pool our resources that we're able to devote to this hobby, and then we can get a better suite of tools. And maybe there's a tool that both of us are using so frequently, we'll get two of those. So maybe we do want to have like your tool and my tool on this one, but there's all these other tools that we can just communally share, and that's great. Or like the idea of a public library. Not everyone has to buy all the books that they're going to read. You can borrow one and then put it back, right? <laughs> like the, the public library is a perfect example of communism um, and what it means to have like partial ownership, um, to have contingent access to something, and that this might actually give you more freedom in the overall picture. Is this making sense to people in chat? That's the basic argument. There are going to be some, I, I mentioned before that uh, a communist doesn't have to say everything is communally held, like we're sharing the same t-shirt or something like that, or like this is this is my hat, I mean we don't have to share this hat <laughs> if we're going to be communists. Um, there could be some things more than other things, but what the communist is saying, or what the Marxist like Cohen is saying, is that there are lots of opportunities for expanded freedoms if we're willing to entertain shared property as something that has more space in our world. The same way that we might want to, that under like capitalist theories, we might want to bring market forces to bear on some aspect of social living because we think there might be some benefit to it. The Marxist here is saying, let's try to bring communally held property into certain aspects of how our society works where there's going to be more benefit as a result. Anthony asks, what's the difference between personal and private property? Um, by personal, you just mean like my example of wearing this hat? I wouldn't share my toothbrush, but I'd share my weed whacker. Yeah, I mean, the, the difference would just be about what kind of, what does your, what are your property rights, right? What is the space that of how our social system is set up that gives you access, that has protected access for you? Remember like we talked about earlier this week, uh, capitalism puts lots of restrictions on people's freedom. That if I'm going to have total control over this Mr. Spock mug or my toothbrush or this hat, then that means there are rules against everyone else messing with those things. So no one else can use your toothbrush if, if, it, if it's yours totally. Like that's what private property is about. You have complete control over this thing. You own it. You have total domination over that object. That means no one else has access to it unless you say it's okay. You give them permission, something like that. Okay? Under communally held property, you still have a, a stake in having access. And if, if, say, society cut off your access entirely, that would be a violation of your property right, just like if someone stole your the thing you have total ownership of. But now, in this case, what you have claim to or what your property right is is not to do whatever you want with this thing. It's not unlimited access, and everyone else is shut out entirely. It's that you have like like a timeshare. <laughs> you have a timeshare in this thing, um, and that's the space of, of your legitimate access. And whatever are the conditions surrounding that are the conditions of your, your property right with respect to that thing. It's saying you can have something. It's not all or nothing. It's not like I have zero access to this thing or I have complete control over it. That's what you get under capitalism. But you can have it sort of in between. You can have a little bit of a stake in it and not total. Does that make sense? Here, there's a couple other, I, I know you're typing in there. I want to use time here because I want to get through going today uh, at the very least. I, we definitely didn't get to multiculturalism, unfortunately. Yeah, I swear I've, I've heard a modified version of this argument from lefties. Um, I don't know what you mean by that exactly, but <laughs> I mean this is this is classic um, a classic defense of what what is the social advantage in oh a <laughs> different different smiley face um, this is a classic example of the just the basic motivation for why communism is maybe a good idea There's a, in a positive way um, so uh, a couple other things um, 
that I want to get in here really quickly. One, if we don't like this, Cohen, Cohen entertains this. Like, he's like, what if we don't like this idea of communally held things? Well, he's worried about a certain bias. Basically, bourgeois materialism, he says. Um, a kind of uh, attachment to material things. Kind of like hoarding. Um, Cohen is worried that we, in our culture, in a capitalist culture, you have an irrational attachment to having complete control over things and treat that as the paradigmatic example of freedom when really you're, if you operate that way, you're missing out on all of these opportunities for freedom um, that you're, um, you're not going to be able to enjoy if you're requiring total domination. Kind of like the child who's not willing to share their toys. They're just losing out on a lot of access. So they're like, I like the rule where I only, where everyone only plays with the things that they own. Well, then there's just a lot of lost opportunity there. If the only, if we never did things that required sharing behaviors, then there's a lot of life we don't get to enjoy. Um, I actually, I forgot to give out the code word. I have not done that yet. Um, code word. Um, how about, uh, <laughs> well, I haven't talked about this yet, but how about post-scarcity? Post-scarcity. No, not, um, I've already done it. I'm sorry. I didn't see it, Mark. But post-scarcity. Post-scarcity economics is really interesting. Um, it's about what happens when you have an economic system where livelihood is not tied with employment. Um, which is very interesting. What what if your access to the things that you need to survive was not mediated through private property? That'd be a very different world. Okay, finally. Uh, oh, I'll just talk about this tomorrow. This is kind of a bigger idea. So, um, yes, exactly, yeah. Um, okay, so I'll let you go. Have a good day, everyone. We'll talk about multiculturalism tomorrow. I'll see you then. And there's a bunch of people who wanted to talk to me on the phone today, so uh, I'll be available later on. Um, it's just been, sometimes I get to your phone calls late because I'm just talking with a bunch of other people. So uh, I'll try to, to make that happen. And Niha, I will see you in a little while. We're going to make that phone call happen. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone.